Welcome everyone to another episode of the Minnesota Rack Stars podcast and today I have with me my neighbor Nick Retka. Now Nick has heard through the grapevine today that uh, there's been a giant spotted on one of his permission properties and we firmly believe that this is a buck that he has had some history with in the past. Um, We just haven't had any confirmation that he's been out there yet but uh, through word of mouth, we found out that uh, there's a pretty good deer roaming around this area. So Nick's going to talk about some of the strategies that he's going to use this this year to try and capitalize on this guy because he's a, a true giant, not only um, from a score standpoint, but just from an age and maturity standpoint as well. And uh, where we're at in our, our hunting career, um, it's more about that age factor that really gets us going. So with that, we're going to keep things short today and just get right to the podcast, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Well, we are back. Another episode here, Minnesota Rack Stars podcast, and today I have with me my neighbor, Nick Retka. Howdy. <laughs> Nick, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate it. Not a problem. I know it was, it was a lot of work to get over here, but uh, yeah. I, I sucked it up and uh, I came over here for you, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, but you burned a lot of gas driving over here. You know, my legs are sore. <laughs> <laughs> Nick and I actually share uh, the same driveway, um, and I guess that's where we're going to start is, um, well, first, let what I'm going to let you introduce yourself, and then I'm going to go right after that. So go ahead. Let, let everybody know who you are and uh, kind of what you do for a living. Well, my name is Nick Redka. I've been in this area my whole entire life, the central Minnesota area hunted since I turned 12 years old and I could actually be out there legally. Well, I guess I've, I would always go sit with the parents and stuff. I'm sure you did that as well well. too, Joe, but yeah, just had an itch from the very beginning. I dressing up as a hunter when you're in diapers practically for Halloween and you got a little grunt call, you're blowing around the house when deer (laughs) season comes around, but yeah. Give, Give me it real quick being, you're talking about going hunting with, with your family Give me the best memory you have of before you could carry a weapon going out there, whether it was with your dad or your mom or whoever, give me your best story real quick, just to get things oh, rocking. Yeah, I already know this one right away. <laughs> so I was probably, I don't know if I was 10 or 11. I know it was very close to being right before I could go out there myself, but I was sitting with my mom and it was just that perfect November morning, you know, nice and cold and just crisp and quiet in the woods and from a long distance away i heard the step 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 stop step 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 (laughs) step step step, stop and i nudge my mom i'm like there's a deer coming and she's like i don't hear anything (laughs) i'm like it's over over there (laughs) hey yeah and pretty soon this buck just comes trotting in and still to this day, it's the biggest buck she's ever shot. Oh, wow. It's a five-year-old buck. Just It was super messed up. It had four points on one side, three on the other, and yeah. it actually had a brow tine and came up and just forked on the one side, and the other side was kind of this messed up uh, four-point side, but just heavy on those wow. bases. Wow. Such a cool deer, and this thing trots right in, right in front of us and just stops <laughs> my mom's so excited like she just sees this big body deer yeah. and big rack and she just stands up and boom <laughs> deer doesn't move <laughs> boom deer runs about 10 yards stops and just looks at us again she racks another one boom doesn't move again <laughs> racks another one boom and then just <laughs> takes off running and i'm like you got him yeah and she wasn't sure but we uh we end up waiting a little bit and I said, we got to go look for blood. So we get down and we go walk over there and we found blood right away. And we only walked like 10 more yards and could see him over there. Sweet. And yeah. Dad came over and it was just cool. It was such a big deer to be a part of at such a young age. And that definitely helps. Yep. Definitely helps have the passion, instill the passion right out of the gate. No doubt. And as you could tell already that Nick's family is big into hunting and obviously <laughs> that's where he gets it from, but uh, I'll let you continue with your little introduction. 
Oh yeah. So uh, sorry to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. I don't get to tell that story too often, but uh, yeah. So I actually just recently got into fishing guiding. So I work with another guy out of Brainerd and I have my own guide service called the fish guide guide service and been running a lot of trips this year for a little bit of everything. Walleyes, muskies, bass, pike, just everything in that Brainerd Lakes area. But that's been a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to already doing it again next year because this season is really winding down. But there's still some good fishing left to be had. I'm pretty excited. I got a couple just booked a couple trips late in October for some muskie, so that should be a good time. Yeah, and what I what I find interesting is the amount of people that you guide that are from out of state. Oh yeah, yeah, that's like fifty percent, I would say, if not more. What's the? Uh, I mean, what was it? D.C. Did you have somebody from Washington, just D.C., Was- yeah. Florida, Texas, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa, Colorado? Um. I think that might be it for this year. Sure. But I had repeats from all of those states, actually. There was multiple from all of those states. Sure. Oh, and Missouri. Missouri had a bunch from Missouri. What uh, what species do you target? Oh, walleyes is obviously most people's go-to mm-hmm. in this area. But my favorite are probably the smallmouth bass and muskies, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you guys will have to go over and check out uh, Nick's instagram page because he's got some pictures of some monster fish uh that either he's caught himself or has helped guided people uh in in catching but uh yeah we'll have to get out again you took me out once last year and we were out on the river and and uh yeah it was it was all new to me you know fishing (laughs) for muskie and we actually had one follow uh all the way up to the boat and uh I panicked a little bit, and I think I, I set <laughs> set the hook before I was even in its mouth. So, we'll we'll get one eventually here. But uh, um, I just kind of want to talk about how how we met and um, how we ended up right here, essentially, and what it was. Um, my wife and I were looking for a, a house to to live and and. Uh, buy and we always wanted some property we always wanted to be out in the country and um i was looking in the area that kind of split you know our two jobs and i was looking in that area and and all of a sudden i saw a place come up for sale and um what what i like to do if there's a piece of property or house or something that you know i i'm looking to purchase as I start contacting people through facebook and you know other social media platforms just to kind of get a little insight on on the area what it's about you know who the neighbors are get to know the neighbors before you move there right and um nick was one of the guys i reached out to uh not knowing him and uh he he kind of figured out who i was and he he knew that i like hunting we started talking hunting right away i'm like well these are gonna be some good neighbors to have if i can get this place and uh yeah nick kind of led me in the right direction and, and helping me purchase this place here and you know, if it weren't for him and the and uh, the help that he gave me along the way, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here right now in uh, what I call a dream home and a dream property. I mean, I got 43 acres here. I got a nice house and we're right in the country. And from where my wife works and where I work, it's like 20 minutes a piece. You know, she goes north and I go south and it it lines up just perfectly. But uh, yeah, to start things off, I mean, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. So <laughs> I got to thank you for that. Just uh, hyping you up with all them deer picks. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. Um, well, let's get into a, kind of our, our, our topic for tonight. And we're going to kind of talk about um, some of these bucks we're going to be going after this year. And uh, we both hunt multiple permission properties. Uh, the bucks that we're going to be talking about aren't even on our properties here. <laughs> they're, no, they're not. They're, they're on different pieces of ground. And... Um, let's, let's talk about this property a little bit, um, and some of the history that you have maybe on this property and what you've learned about this property throughout the years. Yeah. So obviously permission pieces, you don't get to do hardly anything to it whatsoever. Uh, recently though, I've actually been able to plant a food plot the last couple of years back there just paid for the ground and uh 
put that into beans, corn, and whatever else I could get to grow there. So that's been a change over the last couple of years, but I've been hunting this land for quite a few years with zero changes to the property ever, just hunting off of crop rotations. And a lot of times it really didn't change. It kind of stayed the same. Uh, very seldom was there ever a rotation in something, but it was, it was different back in the day when I first started hunting out there, doing a lot of sitting whenever, you know, going to the same stands all the time, watching a bunch of deer from the very first opening weekend there you see a bunch of deer out there you have a good time not knowing anything you spook them all off when you walk out and you just expect to go back there and see them the next time and there's half as deer half as many deer the next time the next time you go back there's only a couple deer the next time you go back you don't even see anything you're like well what what happened where'd they all go so that was that was the way i used to hunt and now i've kind of reverted from there to hunting only when the time is right and it's been paying off the last few years. We've been very fortunate the last few years to get on some really good deer and now have another deer out there that I'm hoping to, to get a crack at now that got a couple of histories with a couple of years of history with now just it's, it's going to be a tough one, Joe. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing there's going to be some sleepless nights <laughs> up ahead. Um, Archery season open, was it two weeks now? It's been open for two weeks. And, um, you know, Nick and I kind of have the same philosophy when it comes to hunting. We, we bounce a lot of things off each other, and we kind of wait, you know, for, for the pressure to be rising and those cool temps to be hitting. And it looks like uh, not this weekend, but the following weekend, um, there's going to be a, a nice cold front moving in uh, early October here, and uh, we're probably both going to be in the stand but um, what have you done this year to prepare for the news that you heard today kind of confirming that the buck you've been going after is still out there? So Obvi what, what have you done? Obviously not enough. Because <laughs> right. I should have known about him already. Right. But, uh, yeah, I had a, had a few issues with some cameras earlier this year, which I just, I got a little frustrated with, ended up not putting out as many as I normally do, which now is obviously a mistake. <laughs> that was, that was some, a decision I'm regretting now, but hopefully with the information I've gathered over the last few years, I can at least take a step in the right direction. I did go out there now through a couple more cams out uh, in the area. I'm thinking will be my best opportunity it's just such a weird spot and i don't know if i just don't know it like if a, if this deer is kind of surprising me with what he's doing and not following the norm of all the other deer i've ever seen out there but he's really eluded me you know over the last few years uh i mean get some pictures early he kind of disappears the one year when he actually had the biggest rack i get a random picture of him further away from where I even plan on hunting, but still part of the property. And it was broad daylight mm -hmm. in uh, probably like the t early 20s of October. I think it was like the 21st or 22nd, if I remember off the top of my head. And yeah, we just cruising, cruising by through there. And I've never had a picture of him on that camera ever since. And that was the only picture that year. That was the only picture of him as well on that camera. So it's, it's weird. I just know I'm not where I'm concentrating. My efforts isn't really close to his core, Yep. but he still is showing up. And we've, we've talked about where we thought he might be and, you know, kind of the news that, you know, you heard today, um, kind of, kind of confirms like that's kind of that area he's, he's hanging out. Right. Um, Let's let's give a little let's give our, our listeners a little peek or, or explanation on what he looked like last year. We don't know what he looks like this year yet. No, not yet. We have no clue. But let's tell everyone what he looked like last year. Last year he was a mainframe um I mean just a straight typical eleven. Mm -hmm. Six on one side, five on the other, and 
pretty heavy in the beams, not super tall on the tines, but just a solid, solid buck for around here, probably still in that 160 mm -hmm. caliber, right around that 160 mark. Tough to, tough to tell a couple inches one way or another. Could be high 50s, could be low 60s, but the year before, Joe, that was... Yeah. <laughs> tell him what he was the year before. <laughs> the most beautiful deer I've ever seen in my entire life. Just straight six by six. Every time looked almost perfect. Yep. And that was the year that he actually daylighted in that camera mm -hmm. in October there. But it just, I just could never figure out any sort of way to hunt him. And what he was doing made no rhyme or reason. And my guess is this property is setting up a lot like the property you're hunt one of the properties you're hunting as well too, Joe. Yep. And you know how difficult that has been to try to pattern a property like that, where it's just kind of bigger green pasture fields. They got food in them mm -hmm. for the deer, but where does a guy start out there? Because every, almost everything seems like it could be a betting spot. There's, there's plenty of opportunities and, there's not so many deer that every single spot is taken up by the deer. So it seems like to me, they rotate. They'll like bed here one day, here the next, here the next, there the next. And it's all kind of based on wind directions. You're, you're exactly right. And, and, uh, I kind of, I kind of learned this when I was hunting out in South Dakota is take a step back before you take a step forward. And what I mean by that is, is, uh, hunt the outer edges do your scouting and then go in for the kill you know what i mean and that's what i like to do out in south dakota you know that first morning that first evening you know if i get a four-day trip that's usually what i plan out there's a four-day trip morning one night one i am up top glassing and i'm looking to see where they're at and i can see a long ways out there and and i will tell you this that they're not in the same spot every night you know what i mean they're, they're <laughs> yep. just not they're not and this, I, I, like I said, I hunt multiple pro, uh, permission properties, but this, this one property in particular that I'm going to be hunting a decent amount this year because I got a decent shooter on camera right now. Um, last year was my first year hunting it, and I went into the spot that I thought was going to be the best spot on the farm, right? And I go in there, and I wasn't seeing anything. And I'm like, this is a phenomenal spot, okay? It's a ridge. It's 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 a funnel with, with hardwoods because there's field on both sides. I mean, everything you could ask for, especially come rut. You know, you got some food there that's secluded. It's in the back of the timber. There's It drops down into a swamp, so you got bedding down below, and you got the ridge up top, you know, for those cruising bucks, and that's what I was kind of thinking to hit that spot. And... I would go in there and I wasn't seeing anything and I wasn't seeing anything. And, and like I mentioned on the previous podcast, I was dealing with wolves as well. But this year I, I put a camera back in the spot where I picked up a couple bucks on camera the previous year here. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put that camera back up there. And once you know it, I'll get a shooter on camera right there. And he's running with another buck and he actually daylighted this it was sunday of the opener and uh so i'm like okay if he's gonna daylight here i'm gonna hang a stand on the opposite side of the field and i had to because of the wind and i just wanted to kind of scout to see uh you know where he was coming out and then make my move and here i i realized because deer did come out of the woods but where were they coming out of right where i was walking through to go up to this prime time spot where I thought all the deer were going to be moving to they're bedding right probably on that ridge. They're probably bedding down in that swamp grass down below. And I was walking right through them to get to a stand. And, and so that's kind of my, my thought process. If you want to be successful, take a step back before you take a step in and look at things from afar before you really dive in and try to make things happen. No, I definitely, definitely agree with that and so my question to you is then are you doing that only with your observation sits or are you relying on cameras like what what percentages would you put to each one of those for your scouting intel is it your 
your sitting that tells you roughly where the majority of the deer come from because it's really hard to see a big buck and on its hoofs too so are you just relying on the big buck trail cam data for kind of your patterning or are you really looking to do observation sits on really really good nights where you could be going in for the kill but you're trying to just learn more in that circumstance on a newer property where you should just be sitting instead for me it's it's being out there because (laughs) when i was out there the other day i watched four deer go by a particular camera and i had zero pictures that (laughs) night like I, I'm not going off trail cameras. I don't, I don't care how good you, you know, your cameras are, you, you can't bank everything on your trail cameras. And the thing is too, with mature buck, like we're going after those things figure it out pretty fast oh, yeah. where those cameras are. And I actually have footage, actually Pete, uh, videoed this buck that he, he actually set up a trail camera. He was out in North Dakota. He set up a trail camera, and he's videoing this buck coming in, and he this buck goes right up to the trail camera. He's looking at I mean, he's cautious the entire time, and that thing was so skittish of that camera. And this was a year-and-a-half old buck. You know, What's... these, these four-and-a-halves, five-and-a-halves, they're, they're going to figure that out quickly, and they're going to half-moon around or go on the backside or something. So for me, it's – it's being out in the stand on the right winds, like you were saying, and making sure it's bulletproof before you go in. Was that camera, when he put it out there, was that right? Like, there was never a camera there, for, and he put it there, and that was that night? Yes. Okay. Yep, yep. That makes so sense. The, so there might have been some scent there and stuff, yep. too. But they, those deer are smart, man. Oh, I mean, they are. They, they yeah. know their surroundings, and all of a sudden, there's, there's something different there. And... You know, who's, who's to say these, I, one day I would love to like experience the senses that deer have. It, it, it's gotta I don't know be insane. If you would, Joe. I, I it, it would be awesome to like, even like dogs. I was thinking the other day, we we're up at my in-laws lake and this dog is sitting there and all of a sudden the dog starts going crazy. And, and I'm like, my guess is there's somebody here and I have no clue, you know? Mm-hmm. So I go look out the front door. Yeah. Here comes its owner and, and their kid coming yep. down the hill. And I had no clue that they were coming. So the senses that they have is just amazing. And and what, what can they detect in a camera that we can't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just there, there might be noise or something going on in there that we have no clue about. I tell you what, I think I've learned a lot about, deer senses and what a person can get away with and what a person can't by actually having a dog i never had a dog my whole life growing up got a dog uh when i was towards the end of college watching that thing do what dogs do and do what animals do they always do something for a reason yeah they never just go and sit on like sit on its dog pillow right well, some days he goes and lays on the floor. Well, why is he laying on the floor when there's a perfectly good pillow right there? Right. Or why is he laying there when he's instead of being up on the couch where it's obviously more comfortable? Well, it's because it's cooler. Okay, well, that's kind of a deer doing the same thing, right? A deer is going to want to move with temperatures as well. And same thing with a dog's nose. You could take a dog on a walk and all of a sudden you're walking down the middle of the road <laughs> it's freaking and out. he puts his nose down and starts running right over into the woods. Yep. And you're like, well, what's he doing? Oh, there's a deer trail right there. Well, there's fresh tracks right on the yeah. gravel here. He, they, they have such good senses themselves, and that's kind of what led me to believe that. Yeah, why, why am I ever trying to put it past a deer that a deer yeah. can do the same thing? I feel like they can, they can definitely sense when you step on even a tuft of clover mm-hmm. that's right in their food plot there and you're going to the tree to hang up the camera and all of a sudden you matted down that clover well if a deer walks there that day they see the matted down clover and they're like well that's goofy yeah that's not right yep it's it's wild and uh yeah if you think you're gonna beat a deer's nose good luck (laughs) yeah um let me ask you what 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 do you think your plan of attack is going to be together until on this buck to try to put them down probably trail cameras. Yeah, yeah. As much as I don't want to just rely on trail cameras with everything else going on, it's going to be really tough to get out and do some observation sits. Yep. And with the couple of years of intel I have on him, I don't have a, a ton to go off of, but I do have something. Mm-hmm. And then just using using the field's natural layout to my advantage. I feel like I know how I can get a little closer to this deer as long as I get confirmation that he's coming through this area. 
And if I get that cold front, so he comes out a little bit earlier, this field is probably where, where I'm planning on hunting, maybe 75 yards across. Mm -hmm. But the only food in that 75 yards is on one side because all the rest is just grasses with nothing really in the grasses themselves. It's kind of swamp grasses. But then all the alfalfa is up towards one direction of that field. So if I can get that deer to come through the alfalfa instead of just the grasses, because that's where I think most of the other deer are going to come anyways. That's where the does and fawns are going to be walking through. That's where every deer is going to be laying its scent down is through that alfalfa. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have a better chance of sitting that side versus the other side. And I, obviously wind direction can dictate that a little bit too, but I do feel like that's going to be the tendency of the deer is to stay to that side of the field. And that is kind of what I saw last year without running too many trail cameras over there. There was definitely a tendency for him to be on one camera versus the other. And the only th reason I can put that in, uh, in my own mind of why he would do that is because everything else is happening on that one side of the field. That's where all the deer are. That's where the alfalfa is. And there's no reason for him to go on the other side besides maybe security. But then again, it's, it's iffy over there too. Is this going to be a sit where you're going to have to worry about getting busted by a doe before he comes out? For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yep. That's, that's a tough part. Like I went out two nights ago and, um, I had a, the perfect wind for an observation sit. It was a Northeast wind and he was going to be coming out East of me if, if he was going to come out, which I believe. And, and, uh, these does come out and they start two does, two fawns, and they start going with the wind eating in this field. And I'm like, why are they going with the wind? And all of a sudden they, they went about 30 yards and they stopped. And what they do, they worked back into the wind, you know, they're like, yeah, this isn't right. We got to go the other way. And they came right over to my stand. And, you know, it's one of those, those cool situations where you're in a stand, they have no clue you're there and you can just hear them munching on those acorns mm -hmm. just mashing them right and uh they were there for a while and then eventually one looped around me on the back side and she took off running so all four of them ran with her and uh they're kind of curious what was going on and then gave one blow and then they took off sure so it was good they didn't you know blow up the whole woods and everything sit there for 20 oh, minutes. oh <laughs> man there's nothing worse but so, so this property, you've hunted it for a long time, right? And yep. if you were, I mean, obviously you're going to be going out here in October here to, to try to put them down. But when you go out, sometimes there's a level of confidence, right? Say, say you get a picture of him. Say you don't get a picture of him and this cold front comes. Are you going out in that area where, where you've heard he's been? That's... The only reason I'm hesitating is because of the other bucks that I have on camera as well. And I have a better feeling that I could have a really good opportunity at that cold front coming next weekend mm -hmm. going after that buck. So mm -hmm. if I don't have confirmation of this buck using the field, how I think he's using it in the next week leading up to there, I am. I want. <laughs> I want to say I'm going to go after that buck, but the other one isn't so bad either. <laughs> right, right, right. And he's definitely way more killable. Yeah. And yep. so it's just a matter of okay, how much do I want to put into somebody else's word? Mm -hmm. Which in this case it seems pretty reliable. Yeah. I. I. I'm not going to say that it's definitely like this guy's lying or anything like that. I think he's definitely seeing what I think he's seeing. It's, it's just that I have so much confidence in killing that other buck in that <laughs> same time frame because I had daylight pictures of him on October 7th of last year too. And it was the same stand. I killed a buck out of two years ago as well. And I have a feeling he's running the same program. So if I don't get confirmation, I think the other deer is in trouble instead, mm -hmm. of, instead of that one. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to say I, I got enough to hold out for that one, but I don't think I do. Yeah, they're both both going to be really good deer. And right now we just have word of mouth um, 
on what this deer looks like and possibly scores, right? So you're right. You, in your mind right now, based off of what you heard, what does this deer look like right now? Based off of what you heard. It's tough because it's a drought year. And this drought was worse than the previous two years, I would say. I, yeah, I think is what I heard. And it, it seemed like too. But and on top of that, the winter we had, yeah, brutal winter, late start to antler growth. I still feel like he's got to be a upper fifties ten point at a minimum, mm-hmm. just based off of everything else he's been over the last two previous years, being of like that one seventy class the first time uh, as that six by six, and then that right around that one sixty mark as that 11 i if if his antler girl struggled this year he's still an upper 50s buck oh yeah oh yeah um you know like you said he was a six by six two years ago last year he was a five by no uh, six by five yep right yep and that was a drought year now this is a drought year again so yeah it'll be interesting to see right you know but uh from what we kind of heard he's 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 a pretty good buck um Say, say you don't have the intel, okay, this this upcoming week, and you go out and you, you, you're not able to harvest this other buck that you were just talking about. Throughout, when, when would you say would be the time you would have a good opportunity to kill this deer? Muzzle loader. Why is that? History says that uh, muzzleloader has been good to us out there. <laughs> Just a little, right? <laughs> yeah, we've uh, been very fortunate out there. Uh, cracked two really good ones with some age even. When was it? 2020, uh, my dad got a 5x5 five five that was right around 160. And then 2017, I shot a... It, it wasn't quite enough points to technically be considered non-typical, but he had a bunch of junk going on and, uh, he ended up being about 164 and and a half. Yeah, that was, uh, both are a really nice deer and the buck that your dad shot, he was one of those bucks too, where I think he was bigger the year before also. Yeah. And I don't know what happened there. I guess I don't remember what the winter was like and the summer was like, but he he came down a little bit, but man, has that thing got some mass oh, yeah. and some daggers for points. Yeah, that uh, those circumferences were over six inches in yeah. a couple spots. <laughs> oh man, yeah. And why do you think that that muzzleloader time frame is is such a good time frame to be out there in that spot? I, I actually I just like it in general. Um, but that spot has just been good to us because it just seems like those deer are able to hunker down and live in some areas survive through that rifle season and then once they get to that muzzleloader season they're looking for that last doe coming in and every buck we've seen they they've wanted to eat a little bit but they've also been running too they have their nose up they're cruising but they also stop to eat a little bit and we give them just enough food to make them stop and eat a little bit over there that food plot that uh I was able to plant out there. Dad shot that buck right off that food plot and that buck daylighted two days in a row. And he came out the exact same way both times during that late season. And there was also a couple does and fawns running around there. And I didn't get proof that that's what he was doing, but every other buck that we see during that time frame, if it's not the big ones too, doing the same thing. They're just pushing those does and fawns around over there. I guess that's the one thing I've, I've, learned about this property through you is that the deer become pretty patternable out there based off of previous observations trail cameras hunts all that stuff where all of a sudden you get that right wind that you need for that that field or that stand and sure enough like clockwork those deer come out of those spots and i think you you actually called your shot or your dad shot when both. When you guys went out there, yeah, yeah, it both. just like, and I remember talking to you. Dad's gonna shoot that buck tonight, and sure enough, yeah, they ended up doing it. Um, I actually, when I, I shot mine too, uh, 
that was the second time I shot him when I actually killed him. But I was up in Bemidji hunting with oh, some yeah. buddies and I looked at the weather forecast and said, I got to leave guys. I got to go home. That deer's killable tonight. I drove two hours back home, jump up and I literally drove straight from there, straight to the stand. <laughs> I got up there and I think it was an hour and 45 minutes later, I was pulling the trigger on him and then sending pictures to those guys. And they just couldn't believe it that I literally said I had to go to kill that buck that day. And sure enough, it worked out. So this, you gathered that intel on DeerCast. Is that is that where you? I I like DeerCast. <laughs> I think that was before DeerCast. <laughs> it wasn't was before DeerCast. That's what I'm saying. But yeah, it was Mark Jury's information. Sure, I, I was yeah. listening to Mark Jury back then. I actually took notes the very first time yeah. I ever heard him break that stuff down because it was just so ingenious. Yeah, and it really just opened my eyes to just pay attention to that weather mm-hmm. and document that weather, and. When I killed that buck, it def it technically wasn't the day that Mark Jury said would be great on his app. In if you were looking at it on that, if that app was created sure. during that time yep. frame, yep. But what he just taught me was pay attention to the weather. Mm-hmm. Those deer are there for a reason, and they come to that field specifically for a specific reason. You figure out that reason, and they just became more killable. And that deer for me. It was a specific wind direction. It just so happened to be around a specific moon phase too. Both times I actually got my opportunity at them because I I got an opportunity at them in late, late October. And then I ended up killing him uh, a couple days into December. And both times it was right around full moon. So I don't know if that had to do with those does and fawns, you know, starting to come in on both of those times Mm -hmm. right there too. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I didn't have hardly any pictures of him in between. I had one picture right after rifle season, I believe of that buck just telling me he survived. Otherwise there was zero pictures of him from when I hit him the first time I got that one picture right after rifle season. And then I killed him on December 3rd. If you had to pick, okay, you, you get one, you get a third to hunt right out of the entire season. It's either going to be early season, rut, or late season out there. Where do you think your best opportunity would be to kill this deer? Muzzle loader, for sure. And so that's like that end of November, early December. And I just just want to make this clear for people out there. Um, Nick's not the only one that hunts this property. And he is saying that he would put all his chips in on muzzleloader. There are people that hunt it with firearms, yep. bow, and you guys might be the only one that muzzleloaded it, I think. But uh, nope. There, there's other people out yep. there. Okay, yeah. And that's where he would put all his chips in. And, and the reason why I think you're saying that is because not only the, the previous – history that you have out there but these bucks know what they're doing out on that property they know how to get by and i don't know if it's because of the other hunters making mistakes and they educate these deer and then they make their transition moves to okay it's time to take cover and then boom they go nocturnal or they go to a really thick spot and they they find a secluded food source or whatever it is and they hunker down and they hunker down until it's time where they need to absolutely eat, or there's that last doe coming in asterisk or fawn or whatever the case might be, and it just so happens to be out on that property or something. You right. know what I mean? Right. Yeah. You no, know, there's there's something going on that prevents deer. Sometimes, I mean, obviously, there's a lot, plenty of deer that get shot. Yep. I, a lot of a lot of young up and comers yep. that get shot that are like, oh, that one hurts a little bit. But, yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. No. There's there's something to those bigger deer they got a they got some sort of system figured out to survive once they get to about that four-year-old age class Mm -hmm. which takes a lot to even get a four-year-old around here too yeah the two-year-olds are very very vulnerable out there uh the three-year-olds get a little bit better chance four-year-olds you're like okay this deer could be a, a good survivor to make it to five six years old yeah um but 
I think what happens is I don't even think it's necessarily a pressure on that property. It's the pressure on the properties around there sure. that end up pushing these deer somewhere. I don't know where, but somewhere where it just throws them so off that they just don't come back during the rest of rifle season or mm-hmm. something. I'm not sure. It's it's crazy because my cousin has a has a buck on camera right now, and I'm not lying when maybe a hundred inches. It's it's a mainframe eight, I believe, but this deer has got to be eight years old. I mean, it, we were looking at his sheds uh, the other night, and it looks like it should be like a two year old, but the bases are too big for a two year old. You know what I mean? Sure. And like the brow tines are longer than the G2s. It's just, <laughs> I mean, just a big burly deer, but they get trail camera pictures of them and then nobody sees them during season. And they, they hunt quite a bit. And there's other people that hunt, you know, the neighboring properties and nobody's ever seen this deer before. And it just, just gone. Like they get so smart and, and hear me out when i say this yes they're smart but i me personally when they're one and they're two and even three sometimes i think that they they find these spots on accident oh for sure and and all of a sudden they're just in the right spot at the right time where they're not pressured by hunters or getting shot and then or maybe they get shot at and then they get smart real fast you know but a lot of it's luck but once they get to that, I, I'm going to say four. I, I mean, three, three, yeah. I mean, but still, you see some three-year-olds make some dumb mistakes. But they're getting better. But they're getting better, they're no getting doubt. Better. No doubt. But once they hit that four mark, I mean, they, they know exactly what to do. I mean, it's like clockwork. They know exactly what to do when they need to do it that time of year, and, and they get smart. But now on the flip side, we've heard this this deer – has has been out in the daylight that you're going to be going after you know that kind of goes that theory where as they get older sometimes they become a little more visible which might help you in the end here well one can only hope (laughs) right right um but to kind of going back to like what we were talking about how some of these bucks make it through it just seems like every big buck that you end up getting on camera on this property finds a way to survive until you guys drop them late season. It just, it just <laughs> seems like that. There is a lot of them that can make it to that late season. I don't get it. Like On paper, you would never guess that. Yeah. yeah. It just does not look like that type of property. And then when you hear about all the pressure that it receives, not just from me, but it's mainly from everybody else. Because I, I pick and choose. A lot of times it's three, four sits before rifle. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And then after rifle, I'll pick and pick and choose another three, four. And that could be as many times as I hunt that property in a year is seven, eight. Right. And that's, I don't know, to me, I've, I feel like I've been more successful, not only out of state, but in state seeing deer by hunting less and hunting the right weather systems and all that stuff. Uh, And then, like I said, the winds entry exit, getting in and out of there. I mean, just the amount of deer I've been seeing now compared to when i used to hunt like i was i was actually thinking in the stand the other night like what in the h was i thinking hunting back in the day like seriously like oh yeah i'd i'd go to a stand cut right across the middle of the field and guess how i had to get out cut right back across the field again just blowing things up the deer yeah yeah and then you know complain why yeah, i'm not seeing any deer anymore well you know like you said do things for a reason because deer do things for a reason you know they're gonna move they're not, they're not just going to pack up and say, hey, let's go grab a bite to eat. No, it's it's strategic, you know. Well, I saw 15 deer. Well, how old were they? How big were they? Were they does and fawns? You know, were they yearlings, two-year-olds? What were they? Um, but if, if you're out there going after a, a mature deer, you got to do things for a reason because they're doing things for a reason. And and kind of my my analogy to people when when I explain to them, you know, why you need to hunt the right winds and, and pressures and all that stuff. You know, let's let's say I got a wind blowing right into the bedding, right? And we were talking about with dogs. You know, they can sense things. They can smell things. Deer can smell like we can see, right? I mean, we need to see things to know that they're there. They just need to smell it to know that something's there. 
And what I say, it's like playing cards with your cards held backwards with somebody and they can see exactly the hand that you have. And that's, that's what I envision. If you're hunting the wrong win, those deer can see your cards pretty good. Yeah. They can see your cards. They know exactly where you are, you know, and, and before you even know that they're there, you're, you're showing them your hand and guess what? The game's over. And, and it takes a while for people to understand that. And the best way to understand that is by making mistakes. Yep. And that's how we've learned throughout the years. And that's how everyone learns throughout the years is, is through mistakes. Because it's very hard to understand something when you haven't experienced it yourself. I can tell you things and you're like, okay, yep, yep, yep. But until you actually experience it, it's it's difficult to understand and really comprehend. It hurts a lot making those mistakes, so <laughs> it does. <laughs> so here's the question. Yeah. How do you plan on hunting your buck without making that mistake? You've got how many, one one two two pictures this year so far of two, that buck? Two, yes. Okay. Yep. And, and I've had pictures last year. You've done one observation sit yep. this year. So how many more observation sits you think it's going to take? How many more pictures you think it's going to take before you can actually feel confident in making a move and not making those mistakes? Well, I've I've been so conservative that I haven't even hung a stand over on the side that he's been coming out on, that which I believe he's coming out on. Um, right now, I am playing it extremely safe because based off of last year's intel, it was kind of like your property. It was after firearm season when I had him daylighting on every single camera. I mean, I, I have a ton of pictures of him all over the place. And I don't know if that is because there was a doe or a fawn that come into estrus or the amount of acorns that were in the woods in that spot. And that's the reason why I hung cameras in those spots is because... I was seeing acorns all over the ground. I mean, they were hitting me in the head. I'm like, okay, deer are going to be eating out here. This is a food plot. I'm going to put a camera up here. I'm going to put it down 100 yards and another 100 yards. And I have deer feeding throughout that spot. Now, one, my guess too is what I've learned from that is those trees over there are more late season acorns that they're going to feed on. So, so that's, why I'm playing it safe because I don't want to blow things up right now and play it safe to kind of keep them on the same pattern and then I'll jump into this other spot come later season. However, there is a spot that is really thick, thicker than any other spot on the farm that where I had all those daylight pictures of him, I think he might be hanging out. And if he's not hanging out there, it's a really good spot for a doe to try to escape and get away from a buck during the rut. So I'm going to be hitting that spot over there um, a little closer to this thicker area uh, where I think there's going to be some good deer. And the only tough part is it's uh, really, really close, basically right in the same spot where I saw those timber wolves last year. Sure. So we'll see what happens. But I learned a lot last year on this property. It was a shot in the dark, and I was just going by gut instinct, you know, Okay, here's a little funnel, food, open area. Bucks aren't going to want to go through the open area. They're going to take the inside corner, those types of things. That's where I kind of hung some cameras. But now I have some intel, and I'm going to go off of that, and especially kind of like what you're talking about with your buck, this next cold front coming up. You have the intel from last year. You're going to use that to try to stack the odds in your favor this year, and that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm just going to play it extremely safe. I would like to lay eyes on him to see where he's coming out, but that doesn't mean I can get in that spot. He's coming out in that spot for a reason because the wind's in his favor. But if I could get on the other side of him, say he wants to work a north wind, if I can get a stand on the south side of where he's coming out, I might be able to get a shot, but that's going to be quick. He comes out, you know, there he is, be ready, rock and roll. So have you figured out any specific wind directions for hunting that spot? Like, was there a specific wind direction he was using when he was kind of over there or is there only a certain wind that you can use to access that spot it has to be that otherwise it's just a no-go the wind that he was using is the perfect wind for me to get in he's coming out on the east side of the field and it's a northeast wind 
So if I loop around the bottom side of where he's coming out, my scent will be blowing in the opposite direction. But like I said, I got to be close enough to where he's coming out to get a shot. However, he might be betting 20 yards off the field. You know what I mean? Because if he was daylighting, if he daylighted uh, two weeks ago, he's got to be betting really close to that camera. You know what I mean? Like, he's not going to travel 300 yards in daylight you in, in the evening. You anticipate that staying the same, like him using that same spot for the continuation it's, of the year? It's 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 tough to say. I mean, I, I might – what what I think I'll end up doing is waiting for, like, a picture of him leaving, but a picture of him coming back. And if I see him coming back to that spot, that's when I might hit it if the wind is right. But if I see him walking away and and maybe not working his way back into that spot, um, it's it's going to be tough for me to go in there. I'm I'm so I'm I probably need to be more aggressive. But we have a lot of time right here. You know, I have I have time to try to put a plan together. I'm not just going to jump in and blow things up. Kind of like I said, that one step back. You know, before a step forward, and, and yeah, we're still in we'll September. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's why I went out there because when you have a, a four year old, I, I think he's a four, maybe even a five. If if you have a daylight photo of him, you got to act on it because they're not going to be daylight for too much longer, right? So I don't know. That was that's that's kind of my my philosophy and kind of what I'm going to do. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I was talking to my cousin Ben the other day, and. He's like a September hunter. Oh yeah, and that's it. He's once September's over, he kind of just whatever mm-hmm. about hunting. He's like September's my time. That's when I have my best luck. That's when I get it done. I mean, he went to North Dakota, got it done right away uh, on that opening week there, and he's done it the year before that too, and done it in Minnesota. He's he's good in September, and I don't know if I've killed a buck in September. But some guys just, you know, that he he hunts only public land and he goes and gets after it. And you and I tend to kind of stay stay yep. back and let things kind of f- formulate a plan uh, on their own. And then we just let it develop right in front of our eyes and say, yeah, well, he just laid out the groundwork for us. Let's just go finish this off now. But he, yeah, I guess. I don't know how people can do it in September. Like it, when that when that velvet comes off. I've just never seen anything stay consistent. You have to have a really special property to be able to hunt early season, mid season, and late season. For sure. And that's that's the one thing like I look for. My dream property will have, you know, big open egg with willows and ditches for that early season. And then you need that good thick cover, hard timber for that rut phase, you know. And then you need that good thermal cover for late season along with your big egg fields that you can hold deer. And it's a special property if you can have (laughs) all three phases working in your favor because there are some property like this one over here. I'm not even stepping foot out here because I know that I very, very seldom see a buck before mid-October. I mean, consistently. Yep. I might get one that cruises through once, but that's it. Why Why should I go jumping in there and blowing things up when I know the majority of my buck movement's going to be mid to late October? Do you think that's a product of you still being new to that property, or do you think that's a product of those big ones not being there till that velvet is gone and the leaves are gone and then they establish that as more of a core area because of the lack of intrusion cover whatever it might be over there i i want to believe that you know the lack of intrusion has as a big part of it but the the main factor i i believe is just the amount of food that's out in these big egg fields that these deer can go out in the middle of the field in the middle of the night and know that they're safe from predators and whatnot and they have all the nutrients they need out in these big egg fields because these guys they're putting the proper you know uh, fertilizer on there and chemicals on there to get the optimal growth out of the beans and the corn and the alfalfa Um, so that's that's heaven for those deer but then all of a sudden things start to dry down things start to get harvested 
Um, now they're, those cornfields are no longer, you know, seven, eight feet tall. They're black dirt. So now they have to find these spots where, you know, that are in the woods, you know, the good, good cover and acorns and, and all that good stuff. But, um, it's just, it's just one of those things where, I don't know, uh, you might get a buck that might call us home one day. And I don't know why it would, because it's just, it's just too <laughs> thick, you know, early season, but, yep. um, I don't know. It's just, just kind of the way it is. Um, I've seen it with other properties, you know, I don't have any bucks on camera. Okay. It's, it's early season yet. Bucks still have velvet on. Talk to me in a, you know, a couple months here when they, they shed their velvet right. and then tell me how many bucks you got on camera. But it's, it's, it's one of those things. Like even when I search out permission properties, I kind of look at the property to see if it's a property I'm going to be focusing on early season mid-season, late season, or is it good enough for all three? And if you can get a permission property that's good for all three of those phases, you got a darn nice property. Oh, if you can get a permission property with all three, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. But that's that's a unicorn right there. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. It always seems like there's some sort of manipulation that's needed for it to be, to, for it to excel in all mm-hmm. three of those. So let's... Let's kind of give the listeners here real quick. Um, what percent chance do you feel you have of killing this buck? Oh boy. I I don't feel like it's super high right now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'm gonna go with a five percent. Five percent. Five percent right now. Oh, buckets. Yeah. Until I until I get a little bit more information, I have the history and it's a possibility. And I do think if I sat it enough, if I, if I just went out there and kept sitting, kept sitting, I, I do feel like I could lay eyes on him eventually, but that's definitely not the route I enjoy going. Yep. You, you get burnt out, you got other things to do and then you get behind and everything. And then all of a sudden winter's here and you didn't do anything either. Yep. But I feel like with the help of the cameras, if I can just get a little bit of confirmation, just if I can get like one set of pictures, Mm -hmm. I would bump it up a little bit more than that. Uh, I, I, I do think I have an idea in my head what he's doing. And I think he might, there's two possibilities. He's either betting in a really, really stupid spot that is just so out of the ordinary that it just would make sense for a big buck, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it would, uh, it would be this like small little, little spot that he kind of just found some seclusion with. And if not, he's betting in a bigger, a bigger woods that I know roughly where he's going to come out and where he's going to, how he's going to approach the field where I've got my most of my pictures of him at it's just a matter of if I try to go sit over there I can't sit the other spot too if I sit the field I see both of those spots Mm -hmm. I can see both of those my guesses as to where he's going to come out so do I take and play conservative sit the field watch both and just hope that that cold front brings him out quicker or do I try to press my luck, get back there a little bit further and kind of say he's definitely coming out of here. I want to make sure I get him during daylight just in case that cold front isn't quite enough to get him all the way out to me. And I, I definitely could. It's it's just uh, a little bit bigger of the gamble because you got to go a little bit further in yep. there. The, op- the stand opportunities aren't quite as good either without getting super, super close to him. But it's... It's not impossible nope. to do that either. When, when are you going to take that gamble? When are you going to call me up first, and say, Joe, I'm going. I think, <laughs> I'm going. I think if I get a picture of him first cold front here in whatever it is, eight days from yep. now, I think I sit the field. and Because that will be where his picture was. Yep. At least I know he's using that area if I get that picture. And then I sit there in anticipation of that cold front being enough to get them there earlier mm-hmm. and with enough 
legal daylight to, to get her done. Uh, otherwise, probably into the 20s of October, sure. I would say, is when I make a move a little bit closer to where I think he would be then. Yep. yep. And after this cold front, too, if I don't get a picture of him, I still got about three more cameras I can put out there. And at that point, I think I go expand my cameras a little bit more, get them into a, a couple tighter areas over to his bedroom. That way I can just sneak in, sneak out really quick, get a couple more cameras set up. Obviously there's risk with that too. Like we talked about with them seeing that camera getting boogered up from that, but I think it's worth it. It's worth it at that point. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a picture of them by that first cold front and I really got to try to figure something out. Yep. Yep. It'll be interesting. It's gonna be fun to, uh, you know, track, track this story (laughs) as it goes along here. And, and, uh, we'll definitely share it with you guys. Um, you know, when, when uh, the time comes for, for Nick to, to harvest this deer and hopefully he gets the job done. With that, why don't you just let everyone know where they can kind of follow along uh, with your social media, you know, stuff that you got going on there and your platforms? Well, I have. Platform. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know I what mean, you have. <laughs> I mean, I got my personal page, and that's where I post all my hunting pictures, but then I, I've, shot in, I've shot two deer two deer out in montana since then and i haven't even posted those yet i just don't post anything on my personal page i should get better at that all my fishing stuff though is on the fish guide and that's uh the guide part is spelled g-u-y-d and i just post a bunch of my fishing stuff out there make some make some interesting videos sometimes but more so have fun with it than even promote my guide service i should probably do that a little bit more on there too maybe that would help out a little bit but yeah i just like having fun with filming filming's a good time yeah it's it's fun and and i've learned a lot from from yourself you know since i've moved in here we, we talk so much and we're kind of on the same page and uh you've really helped me come a long ways and in, in really thinking you're, you're you're such a critical thinker and i and i like that about you that you break things down even more than what i think about and i like it because it helps me look at things from a different perspective and, and I'm not the type of person to say that I am right. Uh, I will only say that to my daughters <laughs> or I am right. But when it comes to hunting, if, if there's someone out there that thinks they're right about everything, uh, good luck because you get be, humbled quickly. Oh yeah. Big time. Yeah. Big time. Um, so let's say somebody wants to contact you about your guide service. How do they, how do they contact you? through your social media or what yeah social media um might be one of the easier ways uh just send me a direct message on there instagram instagram's probably the best yeah okay all right perfect and also too if you want to get a hold of nick and you can't get a hold of him shoot us a message on our minnesota rack stars facebook page instagram page or whatever and uh we'll get you in contact with nick but with that, Nick, thanks for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, it's going to be a fun ride here, and hopefully uh, we'll have some luck here in the near future. It's getting good. It's it just is. about to get good. It is. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening in. Appreciate it. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that podcast, and I hope you guys picked up on a few different things and maybe some strategies that you guys can use as well this year. It's always a fun time of year. I know Minnesota's been open uh, for a couple weeks now, this is week two. A lot of these other states are going to get rocking and rolling here shortly. October's right around the corner, and uh, some cold fronts are on the way, so make sure you guys get out there and uh, hit the stands, and hopefully you guys have some luck. Uh, and with that, I just want to remind you guys uh, to get out there and like and follow and subscribe to all our social media platforms. Um, pretty excited. Uh, we actually just had a video on YouTube. I think it's at like 95,000 views right now, and that's pretty cool, and that just continues to motivate myself and everyone else that's part of the Minnesota Rack Stars to continue to do what we do, and we thank you guys for, for viewing all those things, so if you like and, and follow and subscribe to all our stuff, you'll be notified when we throw out some new content for you. Also, we want to thank our sponsors once again. Without them, uh, none of this is possible, and that is Arctic Shield. Domain Outdoor, Tact Cam, JNR Outdoors, and also Fourth Arrow Camera Arms. Um, yeah, that's all I got for you guys this week. I appreciate you guys tuning in, and uh, good luck to you, and uh, we'll see you next time.